Okay. We start now? We're starting now. Six months, people. Six months. And bless your hearts for you that endured it and the ones that had to be here. <laughs> I pray, God, God bless you guys. I mean, this is amazing. And for you to have to endure this again, <laughs> it's going to be good. You're going to learn more from Sufa than you ever did from me. Uh, he's, he's, he's a very good teacher, very good teacher. You're going you're gonna to learn a lot from him, a lot of wisdom and knowledge from him. So we're going to continue on, and what we're going to do tonight, we're going to watch, probably, we're just going to watch the videos first, and then we'll go through what I got written out, okay? And then um, he's just going to, he's going to end up with what I got written out. I'm going to add a little bit, and then we're going to go over what we started out. I want to just make a loop, and we're going to talk about theology and doctrine just for a tad bit, because I want you to understand the importance of why we've done this, and why it's important for uh, um, disciples to learn proper theology, to understand proper doctrine. Now, the more I say that out loud, the more that I, I'm pretty sure that's what we're going to do next. I'm, I'm, I still, I don't say it with much confidence, but it's whatever way God leads us. That's, that sounds more like what we need to go into instead of uh, hermeneutics. But um, yes, so today we're going to, we're going to watch the video. It's about two sections, about 15 minutes long, and then we'll go through the rest of it, okay? Can you get that for me, Bill? Well, let's look at some of the biblical rationale, and that will move us along. Because we really haven't finished talking about the nuts and bolts of this yet. Okay, the biblical thinking on this, and this is a radical simplification, summarization of some of the, some of the main observations when you survey the glory of God. Okay, the glory of God is often in Scripture associated with God's presence. Exodus 16, Moses and Aaron said to all the people, at evening you shall know that it was Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of Yahweh because he has heard your grumbling against Yahweh. For what are we that you grumble against us? Um, and uh, Moses goes on, you know, about their complaining and their grumbling. In verse 10, uh, as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. Okay? So, that was a sign of the presence of God. It was a visual manifestation of the unique, personal, covenant presence of God. Yes, God is omnipresent, and he is everywhere, and he was everywhere in Exodus 16, but there was a special manifestation of his presence there. Something similar in Numbers 16, 19. In that horrible story of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and their rebellion against Moses and Aaron. It says, Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting. They were usurping that, you know, the office of priest. And they showed up with their, their censers, their incense burners. And it says, and the glory of Yahweh appeared to all the congregation. And that's when the Lord said to Moses, you might want to stand back. Okay? So, the glory of God is often associated with his presence, particularly in the Old Testament. Okay. Secondly, it's associated with God's self-revelation in creation. And I've already talked about Psalm 19.1. With God's self-revelation in creation. This is general revelation. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and they're doing that without words, right? Day to day pours forth speech, night to night pours forth, or is it knowledge? And then it says there, there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. It's not actual words. That's not that kind of language. And yet they're telling the glory of God, and we can all perceive it, okay? So that's also the glory of God that the heavens are telling us about. Thirdly, it's associated with, uh, with God's divine uniqueness. Uh, 1 Samuel, I've already um, uh, quoted this to you. This is when uh, Saul has you know, fallen from favor, so to speak. And uh, Samuel is distressed. Um, anyway, 
God says, and also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret, okay, in his interaction between Samuel and Saul. And he actually uses glory there as a name for himself. The glory of Israel will not lie or have regret or change his mind. It, it, difficult word to translate there, form of Nahem. Uh, and I believe that it's referring more to changing his mind out of, the, out of, a, out of an attitude of remorse. It's not just simply having regret. It's changing his plan, changing his mind. More of that kind of a thought. When, uh, when he uses God, uh, or uses glory as kind of name, what does the of mean there? The glory of Israel, like how? Sorry, I'm not the pastor's son. The glory of Israel. What I mean, like why is it connected? To, how is it connected to Israel? Is like they're supposed to be giving him glory, or is that, you know, based on our definition? I guess it's based on facts and definition, but I just I don't understand. Yeah. Um, the glory of Israel is referring to the God of Israel. I don't know that I, I don't. I don't think I want to unpack that off the top of my head like that. Um, that's a good question, and clearly, God is referring to Himself, not merely to Israel. But you're right. There's a there's a covenantal relation there. Um, that's probably, at least in part, referred to. I believe so, yes. Which is one reason why it's so stark. In Isaiah 48, God says, For my name's sake I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise I restrain it for you that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. Um, for my own sake, for my own sake, it's repeated there, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. So here, I would say that the emphasis is on the goodness of God and specifically his, um, uh, his mercy, his, uh, uh, his faithfulness, right, to his promises. Okay, and then it, uh, verse 11 makes it very clear. For my own sake... I am being patient. I'm staying my anger and I'm refining you for my own sake. Otherwise, my name will be profaned and my glory I will not give to another. My weightiness, my, um, my honor. So you see that there is an implicit response in there. My glory I will not give to another is against the backdrop of his name being profaned. So there's a particular kind of response that is appropriate to the goodness and greatness of God. And God is trying to minimize the wrong response. He doesn't want his name to be profaned. Does that make sense? It's also associated with God's redemptive goodness. We've been through uh, Exodus 33, so I won't go there. But 2 Corinthians 4.15, we do need to have some New Testament input here. It is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So you see the, the goodness and greatness of God, his grace generously extended to more and more people, and the response of thanksgiving as God's grace is perceived, as his grace is responded to, God is glorified. Okay? More on it, uh, the, the glory of God involving people's perception of and proper response to. I think we've seen a good bit of that already. One more example of that would be from Psalm 57. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Being glorified or his glory being over the earth is something that happens as God is exalted. Uh, I believe I also mentioned verse 11. Which, uh, which is the same refrain. Okay, so the psalmist is not asking that God would somehow turn up the volume on general revelation, right? It's not take Psalm 19.1 and, you know, turn it up to 11. He's, he is um, 
praying in a poetic and, and hymn, hymnic sort of way. He is praying that people over the earth would exalt God. Okay? And I think we've seen, at least as clearly as we're going to see today, uh, the revelation and response pattern here. And then uh, we talked briefly about the eschatological aspect of the glory of God. Romans 8 Uh, we'll just read 18 to 21. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to or in us, depending on how you translate it. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So there's this eschatological, and, and I'm not even going through uh, passages that refer to, you know, God being glorified in the eschaton or in the second coming of Christ. You know, when he comes to be glorified in his saints. I mean, the, the glorifying Christ in the second coming is a major theme. Paul refers to it here as the glory of the children of God the glory that is to be revealed to us or in us. Um, that's, a, that's a key theme, that the glory of God will be perceived at a higher level and responded to, you know, by, by all people that survive, will be responded to. His glory will be more evident. There will be more response um, and then that final state is a state of glory. Okay? So, the glory of God is not, is not just simply an attribute of God. Uh, it's more of a complex. Uh, it's a reference to the, the majesty of God in light of the creature's response it's not just God broadcasting. It's somebody receiving and responding. Okay? Questions? Further comments? Ways that... What, what, are, what are some of the weaknesses in this way? Anytime we try to... It seems wrong-headed to me to speak of a primary attribute of God... For at least these reasons. Okay? Or observations that hopefully will elucidate my thinking on this. God's holy righteousness regulates his love. Otherwise, his love is undiscerning. So God's righteousness, the fact that he is the standard of right and wrong and always does what is right, always acts in, 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 in uh, agreement with his character, that righteousness... Uh, colors, regulates his love. His love is not the kind of love that says, well, I forgive you, it's okay. Let's just forget this, th this ever happened. Okay? Which, by the way, that, that understanding of forgiveness is making a significant resurgence among, among post-liberals. You know, but, uh, I think it's Brian McLaren, just comes out and says, says it in almost those words in one of his books. You know, if God wanted to forgive, he would just forgive. You know, this whole idea of redemptive violence where he has to punish someone, that's, that's primitive. Okay, so that, the idea that God's righteousness is somehow unrelated to his love is uh, popular once again. We could take the opposite perspective or the, the alternate perspective. God's love regulates his holy righteousness. Otherwise, sinners are hopeless. And therein lies the gospel. God's, just as God's love is a righteous love, his righteousness is a loving righteousness. So, We would say that God's attributes inhere in the divine essence. 
they each describe all of God. You understand where in here comes from? It's inherent. God's attributes in here in the divine essence. They are all inherent in. Um, so each of God's attributes describes all of God. An example of this. Yeah. There's a distinction between the essence and attributes of God. Yes. The, the attributes of God are ways of distinguishing the essence of God. Or put it this way. The attributes of God are distinctions in the attributes, in the essence of God. Oh, dear. I'm making it worse. The, don't ever ask me to say anything again. That's the problem. Um, the attributes of God are distinctions in the essence of God. Okay? Each one of the attributes of God is a description of all of God. Okay? So we can't create a hierarchy of attributes because every attribute describes all of God. Okay? The, an essence, the essence of God is a way of referring to the oneness of God. If you remember our discussion of the Trinity, it's referring to the, the godness of God, the oneness of God. Um, you know, to put crass materialistic terms on it, the stuff that God is made of, that's the essence of God. I don't like saying it that way, but it's a, a way of illustrating what I mean. No, holiness is, uh, is simply a description of the otherness of God, the separateness of God. We have to be careful of talking about the essence of God as if it was a thing, a material thing, you know. Yeah. Okay? An illustration of what I mean. The cross emphasizes multiple attributes equally. As a matter of fact, I would say that it's on Calvary that the attributes in Exodus 34, 6, and 7 reach their the, the pinnacle of their expression all at once. The graciousness, compassion, mercy of God, right? His patience, his generosity, his forgiveness, and his justice. They all achieve full expression on the cross. And not before. Up until that point, everything looks forward to that moment. But theologically, at least, it seems to me that there's a tension that's just kind of left in Exodus 34, 7. Um, after, you know, God speaks of all, the, all those wonderful things related to his love and then says that he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. And then he just goes on and renews the covenant and off they go. Anyway. Is that why they say that um, they talk about the wisdom of the cross in the sense that God somehow used it to display everything that was about himself? Um, I don't know. You're talking about um, where God speaks about, or where Paul talks about the wisdom, wisdom of God as opposed to the wisdom of man, like we were looking at last time. Um, I don't know. I don't see that in that particular context. First uh, Corinthians one and two. But I think we could talk about it that way, that the wisdom of God is revealed in the cross, in that it was the way for him to fully express his attributes at once. Yeah. Um, as opposed to the idea that some have advanced in the past you know, that the Old Testament and the New Testament portray different gods. Um, the Old Testament and the New Testament are consistent um, with different emphases. Perhaps, I don't know, I'm less comfortable with this statement than I used to be. Um, there, is, there is an emphasis on the faithfulness, the covenant faithfulness of God in the Old Testament, because there's also the emphasis on the, rebel the stubborn rebelliousness of Israel. So, you know, the, 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 the emphasis of covenant, God's covenant keeping, is perhaps not as strong in the New Testament, but 
Christ is certainly revealed as the one who brings the new covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. Um, and Paul speaks of, you know, himself as a minister of the new covenant, and and on we go. But you could say that there are some subtle differences in the emphasis between Old and New Testament. Um, and particularly if you in, if you try to insist that love is the primary attribute of God, it's really hard to make sense of the universe. And that takes us to the problem of evil, which we will discuss after the break. So I would say that there is no primary attribute, but all of his attributes exist in perfect harmony, equality, and unity in the essence of God. I think that's about the best we can do. should be on like it wasn't before probably the last time you guys going to see Schneider is the one Schneider and Bear talk don't say yay <laughs> <laughs> I know I know we're, we're, I, some of the stuff I know is, it's up there it's up there and it took me a few years just to get a foothold onto it you know but it w the essence of it and we'll, we'll walk through it God's goodness and greatness of God. Okay, this is his glory, all right? It's expressed in his attributes, manifested to his creatures and responded to by them, okay? Such that God is seen to be weighty. Uh, again, I love that word. It, mean, it means substance. It's, it's just something about us, you know, around us. I mean, you, you feel it when you wake up, you take a breath. That's, that's the weight of God. That's his glory. Important, having exerting power, influence, influential, honored, majestic, praiseworthy. This is the weightiness of God's glory about us. Right? This is the beauty that is He. Mr. Gage. Uh, no, no. You, you want me to? You want me to wait? Okay. <laughs> Biblical rationales associated with God's presence. Exodus associated with God's uh, self-revelation. Associated with his divine uniqueness, associated with God's redemptive goodness, the cross. Understand that it's not just, it's, his glory is manifested in what we eat, sleep, we walk on, we, we look up at the sky. It, it's not just the, the presence of him. It's not just who he is. It's everything that is around us in this world about us. Scripture speaks about even the even the heavens declare his glory. Even the heavens, all right? The glory is in the uh, cross, the, the redemptive power of the cross, that he created the universe, gave us an opportunity in the garden to choose him or choose our own way of thinking. And then when he knew what we would do, because he knows the beginning from the end, he let it play out for thousands of years to show our, our want or our need for Christ. And then he came in perfect perfection to find himself as a, a corrupt being to go to the cross to draw and to build that bridge back to him the re redemptive uh, uh, power of the cross this is this this is the glory that god has in him it, i mean he's he's created it he's created the way for genuine love and created for the uh um the power of redemption so we are remission of sins and we're in his grace again I just love the very fact that it is not one aspect of his life that you can't draw his glory from, that you can't draw his glory from. Involves people's perception and proper response to God's present attributes and, oh my gosh, eschatologically um, aspects. The holiness of God doesn't, quali uh, uh, doesn't qualify or as an attribute. Rather, it's a broad description of the goodness of God the distinctiveness of God and the separation from the universe, the aseity of God, the self-revelation, his self-existence. He's unique in himself. I mean, we can share in his glory. But it's, o it's only because he works through us that we share in it. Understand that. And we, on ourselves, uh, we are built for, uh, born into iniquity, transgression. 
when he works through us, that's where his glory shines through, sharing his glory through people through us. Um, be careful not to allow ourselves to describe God on having any primary uh, or having primary to what all attributes are filtered through. Um, and we talked about it last week. A lot of theologies do this. They say that God is love. Okay, we got to be careful that God is. We can't explain the universe because He talks about it. Um, to, uh, uh, what He's saying right here is um, to say that one shining attribute is uh, His shining attribute limits God's omniscience and His power. So He's not just light. All right, it's not just brightness. It's not just holiness. It's not just. It, it is indivisible. God is a hundred percent all the time. He's perfection, perfection. And what we glean from it, what we do is we take those and we put it in a finite compartment and we twist that attribute into our self-made. And that's the problem. We go, God is love. Okay, well, define love. Is it my version of love? Because God's version of love is a lot different than man's perfection. Yeah, ours is, ours is emotional. It, it, ours is uh, um, do what you want. You know, um, free and, you know, no boundaries. That's dangerous love. That's dangerous love. Love has boundaries. It has, it has, it has, um, has repercussions. Love does have repercussions. So God's holy righteousness regulates his love. Otherwise, love is undiscerning. I like how he does this. God's love regulates his holy righteousness. Otherwise, sinners are hopeless. God's attributes uh, in here, his divine essence, they each describe all of God. There's not one separate from the other. I like the fact, scripture talks about God being, uh, that sin or uh, evil is not conquered yet. It talks about, he does, he's not tearing as man perceives tearing. We, we see minute, like I said, second to second, minute to minute, hour to hour. We see the atrocities of life, all right? And a lot of people see, before I was a believer, that's what I saw, the atrocities of life. And I could not understand what I had to go through the hell I went through. Why wasn't God there to help me be, get through the pain? Didn't understand why I had to go through it. And th that's a lot of people hold on to that pain and that abrasiveness to the point where, they have hardened their heart to e even the, the, the idea of playing with the thought of God. I'm, I'm speaking from exer experience. I mean, you go through the what I went through as a child, you will shake your fist and your middle finger at God a lot. But in the time that, that the world showed me 40 years without him, 44 years without him, it comes to a fact that he's, he hasn't defeated it yet. There's only one way to come to a God in genuine love. You have a genuine free choice. You know, it's the only way and towards the end of it all, we got to understand that this is what the world's going through right now. They're, they're having a hard time understanding what genuine love is. And they, they want to redefine. I don't, don't want to give them that can of worms because my Lord, they're redefining everything. Come, to, come this sa Saturday to uh, apologetics and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Concluding observation, and we'll get into some of the things I've added to. Uh, the cross emphasizes a multiple of, uh, attributes uh, equally. Righteousness, judge, uh, justice, love, wrath. Okay, understand it, 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 his holiness demands uh, uh, justice for sin. It demands it. It demands it. He can't, he can't just pardon everybody. And let everybody in the kingdom of heaven, that means that... Um, Everybody has done no wrong, and in essence, in the end, Satan wins if that's the case. Because if there is no there is no punishment for sin, well, then Satan's just running free. He's won. Old Testament and New Testament are consistent with different emphases. Emphases. The universe does not make sense if love is God's primary attribute. Primary evil. Uh, primary evil. Conclusion: All attributes. Primary attributes. But all of God's attributes exist in perfect harmony, uh, equally, and unity in the essence of God. So let's look at it in a different way, in layman's terms. In one sense, the word glory simply translates honor, 
or excellent reputation. Isaiah 43, 7, uh, God speaks of his children whom I created for my glory, not for theirs, for my glory. To understand I will work through them. Um, Romans 3.23, oh, we all sin and fall short of his glory, his glory. It's emphasized on him, not us. Uh, John 17.5, Jesus speaks to his father, the glory which I had with you before the world was made. I find that one the, the most amazing scripture, one of the most amazing scriptures in my heart. When I finish, when that penetrates my heart you think why god would make everything why i mean why would he make all this and go through all this why would he create or give us a choice to sin why would he give us an opportunity and bring us back to that whole that whole position if he had a perfect relationship a perfect relationship before all this was made and jesus talks about it right here the glory which I had with you before the world was made to leave perfection to come to this world to show that is beautiful I mean that is beautiful love it, it emphasizes agape so much that sacrificial love that that want to bring you back to his grace and his amazingness Hebrews 1 3 which says that the son is the radiance of God hmm. the glory of God is not exactly an attribute of his being but rather describes the honor that should be given to God by everything in the universe. What I was saying, the, the breath you take, the ground you walk on, the bed you sleep in, the, the fingers that curl around and grab a bottle, everything is made through him, by him, for him. And that's what brings him glory. In another sense, God's glory means the bright light that surrounds God's presence. Since God is spirit and not energy or matter, the visible light is not part of God's being, but is something that was created. We may define it as the following. God's glory is the great brightness that surrounds God's revelation of himself. I, I love that. So in short, Proverbs uh, 8, 17, Matthew 5, uh, or 7, 7 through 8. Um, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me, Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find it. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks will ask, receive, and seek to find. To him who knocks, opens. Exodus, this is God revealing himself to Moses. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and bounding in goodness, and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And those scriptures I just gave you reveals a, a glory of God that is amazing to us. We've got to understand what, he, what he's trying to get or what he's done and what we're trying to understand. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. All right, we have to understand that he has done all this to bring us to an understanding of right living, a right uh, uh, position with him. All right, and when we, we understand that he is completely glorified, then we're completely satisfied. And that's where he's laid everything out. Now, why, before we go on to, which I am, I'm definite we're going into doctrine tonight. And, um, before we get into it, I want us to understand why we've done all this. And I want us to glean back to where we were before. Did I lose my... <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Let me train you up. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's go on <laughs> to the end. I want you to understand this, and this is what we were talking about, that all these uh, merciful, transcendent, omniscient, gracious, everlasting, the, the attributes of God, all the God attributes describe all of God. There's not one thing that's primary or above every, anything else. They describe all of God, and that's steadfast, man. 
that's faithful. That is, that is stability. That's, that's something that we can rely on. And then it's important that once you're done with this class, once you're done with theology, I want you to understand, again, why theology is important. Okay? Remember what theology is. Theology is the study He just did my to- toggle on, so it's just all powerful and stuff. Yeah. All right. <coughs> Brian stepped out. <laughs> Remember what theology is. Theology simply is it, it's it's the study of God. Theo is God. Ology is the study of. Systematic theology is a is a system by which we study God. Okay, and we'll get into the studying theology helps us overcome wrong ideas. It is crucial that you understand this, especially from what I preached about this last Sunday. It talks about signs and wonders being part of somebody's, and that's what everybody hinges a lot of their religion on or a lot of their faith on. It's crucial to understand that's a wrong way of thinking when it comes to scripture. It's a wrong way of thinking. We have to just the very notion, uh, I'm going to say it this weekend, a lot of our relationships, I, I've been in a lot of relationships in the past where I, I expected the person I was with to be full throttle all the time, uh, physically, intimately, um, uh, romantically, um, just all the time. And if they fell short of that, that's when I started falling away in whatever kind of feeling that fell from them. If we take that approach with God, Think about how long that's going to last. If you always expect him to f- always perform for you, it's not going to last forever. Okay? And if you, you're going to always, you're going to fall short when he doesn't show you signs and miracles. If you go through a, a season of dryness, I just want to throw that out. I'm going to talk about it again this weekend. And ensure us to see the total weight of the teaching of scripture on one subject. And we're going to talk, doctrines talk about how scripture backs up scripture. And that's what theology and doctrine is. That you, you, your theology is built from a sound understanding from, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation uh, 20, 21? Yeah, it's 21. Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> from ha- once upon a time to happily ever after. How about that? That it comes down to that we need to, whatever topic it is, salvation, uh, immaculate conception, redemption, if we understand the totality of it, and we can, we can back up our scripture and our understanding with other scriptures, because nobody can penetrate that. You can stand firm on your belief, and then when people start going, well, you need to start looking at it like this, <clears throat> that's when the spirit checks you, and you go, okay, maybe I need to see it that, but if, you're, if your theology is sound, nobody can really, they can't knock you off the path. It's, it's amazing to watch it, man. Um, we are then less likely to be persuaded even against our own initial wrong, wrongful inclination. It's important. We are our own enemy. When it comes down to it, we, we go off emotion. All right? Understand that. I, I remember ta- uh, uh, when Sora was doing the women's study, she sent out a video of uh, Kiefer doing a um, video uh, talking about agape love. And agape love is, um, it's a choice. It's not a feeling. It's a choice to be made, okay? It is not emotionally uh, driven, but it's it's more of a covenant only made. Now, if you fall in love with, and that sacrifice you give somebody, agape means that you've chosen to to, uh, not only sacrifice for them, but no matter what, have mercy and grace and all these things. That you're a sacrificial, uh, but that's not driven by emotion. It's driven by the, uh, the, the uh, it's about sound doctrine. It's about, you know, so it's, it's not just driven by emotion, by uh, boundaries. Uh, selflessness, selflessness. Two, studying theology helps us uh, to be able to make better decisions later on new questions of doctrine that may arise, or better yet, are here. Progressive Christianity. I, I listened to a guy that elegant in his heresies. El- elegant. 
I mean, it was really well uh, crafted. It was really well performed. But heresy, oh, my Lord. And on top of everything, he's, he's, a, uh, he's, he's a gay preacher. And you're just like, and you're like, from the gate, you're like, but you start listening to the guy, and you're like, if I didn't know any better, and before, before I was a believer, four years ago, five, four and a half years ago, I would have just been like, well, that sounds pretty damn close, you know, sounds reasonable, and he used scripture, not fully, he used bits and pieces of it, he, he uh, made a clause of <laughs> improper interpretations of scripture, and if you didn't understand it, you're going to be deceived going to be deceived um when these controversies of new doctrine come and we are poised with a defense against such doctrine we know the proper respectful response better witnesses of christ we need to be we need to be and the third one studying theology will help us to grow as christ followers people we can't stay stagnant we can't and and i I love, Kirsten, that you're, you're here. I, I swear it is a Dino coming around. I, I swear to God, guys, that is, that, that's, you know, maybe you didn't have nothing better to do tonight. But understand, God is dr- putting you here for a reason. Lorna, amazing. Allie, you're being drugged, I know. <laughs> you're, you're, there, you're her uh, chauffeur. <laughs> it's fine, but what I'm saying is, there's a reason why you're drawn here tonight, okay? There's a reason why you're sitting here tonight. It, it, just being saved will get you into heaven, but it won't make disciples. It won't bring more people through you, and that's what, what we need to do. I don't know if my brother's saved. I don't know if he is. Um, him and I don't like each other. I, I, I love him for what we had, but I hate who he is, okay? I, I really do, and I don't know if there's ever going to be, if, if God... There might be a time, maybe might bring my mom's uh, passing that will bring us together. But beyond that, um, I don't think we'll ever see each other again, honestly. And God's grace is amazing. But my, my point is this, off the tangent a little bit, but if I, if I don't know in that moment in time when he approaches me how to defend the faith that well enough that he sees not Chris but Christ, then I haven't done God anything any good, and I haven't done him any good. He's on his way to a an eternal bath of fire, so we got to be careful. My my point is, be stooped in the word. Proper theology helps us grow as Christ followers. The more we know about God, about His word, about His relationship to the world and mankind, the better I love this. The better we could trust Him, the more fully we could praise Him, and the more readily we can obey Him. Studying systematic theology will make us more mature Christ followers. And it's not just seminary college courses, people. Okay, this is not, it's not, it's not some brainiac, some theologians getting together and piecing together. It's, It's not that. Let me read you something. Hebrews. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Therefore, let us leave elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death and a faith in god instruction about baptisms the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal life and god permitting we will do so we move beyond elementary teaching it's commanded it's it's not just we do we don't just be saved we don't just be saved honor your lord love him and move beyond understand what doctrine is we're gonna just a quick thing on doctrine and where this is scripture as well second timothy 3 16 through 17 all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instructions in righteousness that the man of god may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is what this is what we're going to be doing next is do- doctrine. We did the theology. We we're trying to grow beyond that. First Timothy four twelve and thirteen. Let no one despise your youth, age, but be in. But no, understand this. I'm forty years old. Don't let anybody. It doesn't matter if what position you are. 
It doesn't matter. Don't let anybody despise your youth. But be an example to the believers. And this is where I, this is where I hinge my walk in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. Until I, until I come and give attention, this is an imperative, to the reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. To doctrines next. Doctrines next. A doctrine is what the Bible teaches us about some particular topic. We're going to figure out how you, we're going to maybe sin might be our first one, the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of man, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, we're going to figure out, but this, we're going to show you how these uh, scriptures come together and understand it in their totality and give you the tools. It formalizes an expression of foundational belief. It's a formalized expression of foundational belief. And this is the difference. Theology is defined as a study of God. Doctrine is defined as a system, system teaching on a specific subject. Okay? And this is what we're going to get into next. This is, I just want you to understand, because the way I want, the way I want to finish this off, six months. I know. I love you guys. It's going to be fun. This is how God comes to us. Scriptural verses. Human reasoning. Reasoning from scripture. Understand what God is. Understand who he is in our world. God created us, reasoning, uh, created a reasoning being and gave us scriptures and understanding him. Why? God is a God of relations. This is, this is crucial to understanding how to be a proper Christ follower. Okay, this is crucial to understanding that Christ, is, God has given us all the tools. And if he, he is the 10,000 and he is 90,000 90, piece puzzle and he gives us only a thousand to understand them. I think we can only understand a thousand pieces out of that 90,000 piece puzzle. Finite beings trying to understand infinite God, but it's doable at every level. And I, I love the fact young Buck is just right in his grasp. His head on. Praise God. I'm just saying, you know what? Tomorrow it should be online. You can go then, you know. Oh, look it. It went into the next slide. Oh. <laughs> Any questions? Why can't I stay on that last slide longer? <laughs> Bless your hearts. Bless your hearts for being here. Bless your hearts that I pray that God continues to drive you into a deeper understanding of who he is. All right. And this is uh, this is crucial. And I, I, I know that these seats are going to be full, fuller with more uh, disciples, more disciples. So you guys want to stand? Go ahead.